congratulations on the film. You know, it sort of hits the spot when it comes to the fear factor. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. And I feel like, um, you know, not to diminish in any way your achievement, but this place is immediately quite intimidating. You know, it sort yeah. of taps into your primal fears of being lost underground in the dark, trapped. You know, mm -hmm. how did you sort of feel about what this place could offer you in terms of a canvas to... Well, you know, it, sort of our goal in life is to really try and do as little work as possible. And so if you find a space like this, it, it does so much of the scaring for you. And, and then you get, you know, we were lucky enough to get these uh, wonderful actors who could really sell the scenes. And, and, you know, the combination of those two things, really, the heavy lifting is done. Like, I mean, this, this space is, uh, is something. Yeah, it's just begging for a movie to be made here. And, you know, we, in general, like to go all practical whenever we can and not do, you know, build as little as possible, as little visual effects as possible. And I think uh, this space is just one of the best practical locations you could possibly find. So, um, like John said, it did a lot, of the, a lot of the work for us. And just for an, for an uninitiated, you know, viewer, how would you describe the catacombs? I mean, what are they? And um, what do they sort of lend to you in terms of opportunities to, to, to um, you know, to tell this story? Well, the, the catacombs are 200 miles of, of cord, uh, like a labyrinth of corridors that were originally quarries. Uh, and then in the 1700s, there was too many corpses in the uh, cemeteries and the city was starting to, to smell from them. And so they took six million bodies and put them down in these quarries. And uh, so it's, you know, it's got this history of the, you know, these spaces were dug out in the 1300s. And, um, you know, you can find graffiti here from, you know, the 1600s and 1700s and you can uh, you know in in from you know modern teenagers and um, it's it's you know there's a cinema there was apparently a cinema down here uh, there's like raves and you know there's a there's a real underground kind of element in this really ancient historical space yeah and you know within that you've um, you've built and told a very substantial story you know, drawing on all kinds of sort of history and, you know, aspects of people's life that will resonate with an audience. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, Scarlett's journey and what she's trying to do, um, you know, with this group of, with this group of characters that she sort of gets involved in? Mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Well, they're searching for the, uh, the Nicholas Flamel's uh, Lost Philosopher's Stone. And the Philosopher's Stone, I, I think to her symbolizes, uh, Kind of a guarantee that the people she loves will stop dying you know it, it promises eternal life and and she's seeking something uh outside of herself that she feels will sort of fulfill her and her life and and what she what she needs uh to to go forward and as she goes you know she you know we we really like the idea of a journey being you know searching for something outside of yourself that you realize uh may not be as distant from yourself as you initially anticipated I think the second part of it, too, is that her father was a preeminent alchemist and had spent his life searching for the same thing. And he had been, you know, ridiculed by, you know, more traditional science and was considered crazy. And so her, her you know, one part of her mission was to prove that her father wasn't crazy and, you know, somehow find a way to obtain the unobtainable. Mm -hmm. And within that, she drags in her ex-boyfriend. <laughs> you know, typically, <laughs> what a way to get him back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't want to go down there. Shut up. <laughs> Um, and, you know, within that relationship, you really get to sort of, you know, empathize and sort of feel the, 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 you know, the personality and the sort of fears and inhibitions of these characters. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like that was made uh, all possible by, you know, Perdita and Ben. Mm -hmm. they, they deliver great, like really sort of authentic, sort of nerve shredding performances. Well, thank they you. They did. They, they really did. I mean, we, we really tried to... Uh, you know, go through the script with them and, and let them bring stuff to it. I mean, they're both very smart actors. And, you know, we, we love casting really smart actors because they, they really can bring so much to a role. And, and they both had great ideas and great insights and, and they would bring depth to these, uh, these characters that no other actor um, could have brought, you know, the specifics they brought to these. And, uh, and they were delightful to work with, too. Yeah, this movie had the, the freedom for us as filmmakers. It had the freedom to kind of cast the the best actress for the for the role, and you don't always have that freedom just as a 
you know, total wide open field. And so we read so many people for, for Scarlett and George and, um, and Perdita and, and Ben were just far and away the two best. And, and not every great actor can act in this style of filmmaking in a you know, documentary found footage way. It's very specific and I think audiences have a lot more scrutiny when it comes to performance in this style of filmmaking. So it really takes a, a special actor to be able to pull it off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, talking to these guys today, I know that it was, you know, an operation to just sort of set the junket up for this one day. Um, and to shoot a feature film down here must have been that times five weeks every day. Um, you know, was it grueling? Was it, was it a sort of a draining experience making this film? It was. I mean, it was, you know, really it was exciting. It, it, was, it was such a challenge. There, there's a point at which, you know, it goes from, like, draining or, or nerve-wracking to, like, well, let's, let's, you know, let's barrel through this. And, uh, you know, it was almost like, you know, we had a small army of people for every take, you know, the monitors, uh, you, you couldn't run lines to monitors. So for us to watch the scene uh, as the camera was seeing it, we had to uh, have a little monitor and run behind the actors in the dark because we, we couldn't have headlamps on because uh, or we'd show up in the back of the scene. So we'd be running behind them with an arm up like this just in case the ceiling was too low and hit us here. And, you know, so we were... You know, we'd have like a half a dozen people like running with them everywhere and ducking and hitting the floor when the camera turned around. And we had never planned when the camera would turn around. So we all just sort of had to be on our toes. It was, it was a real, uh, you know, full body, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, kind of adventure. I, mean, I think the shooting of the film was like John said, it was challenging, but really also fun and exciting. It was kind of like commando directing in some ways. But, you know, producerially, the, you know, the preparing for the film was very challenging in that uh, there were so many scenes where we were just, after location scouting, we are just like, how the hell are we going to do this? And, um, <laughs> getting a piano down here or a car <laughs> into burning this space. A car. Was, uh, it was tricky. It was tricky, but, but just, we, we didn't want to build. We, yeah. we wanted to shoot in the real thing. Yeah. You just kind of go one problem at a time down the list, and, and you know, there's always a solution. It's, it's fun when filmmaking, you realize there truly is always a solution. You just Sometimes it's harder to find than others.